is the Association for Information Science and Technology. Um, thank you so much for coming, and I'm glad that you found your way here, whether it was through email or Facebook or um, word of mouth. Jill is the Career Center Liaison for First List. She's a wonderful resource. Um, so if you haven't met her before, I'm really glad you're having this opportunity now. And she's going to talk to us a little bit today about job, um, job interviewing, some skills that we need to put our best foot forward in our interviews. So thank you, Jill, and take it away. All right, here I am. I think I can put a little video up. Oops, let's try it. Now it's not doing it. Let me see. Mm -hmm -hmm. There it is. Hey, it's a little slow and funky, but I thought I'd go, hi, that's me. But I, don't, I won't leave it up there. I'll take it down. But that way you can see. I'm really here. OK, so thanks for having me back. So last uh, November, I did the resume workshop. And so you all invited me back for the second round for interviewing. So thank you very much for that. So I have a lot that we could talk about in interviewing. But since we have an hour, I have narrowed it down to you know, a few key things that are going to be really important. I put together some PowerPoints that will give us a framework to go with. But do ask me your questions. So if we get off track, if I don't make it through all of mine, no big deal, because I want to make sure that I answer your questions. So as we go through, go ahead and type your questions in the chat box, or you can raise your hand and I'll give up the mic, because I definitely want this to be interactive. All right, so here we go. So the best tip overall that I could ever give you about interviewing is to practice, and practice a lot. So I put up a, key, a few key things here for you to think about. Um, practicing by yourself. Sit in front of the mirror if you want to. Be in the shower talking out loud. Um, when you're driving in your car, talk out loud. Whatever works for you. But do practice getting it out of your head, whatever you're thinking about in terms of what you're going to say for your interview, and do it out loud. I like this little cartoon I put here of Darth Vader, because I like at the bottom it says, Vader used to practice in front of the mirror for hours, which I think is kind of cool. So, Practice by yourself. If you're comfortable practicing with another person, fabulous. Find a partner. Practice back and forth answering your questions. But that's the best thing that you can do. I actually recommend recording yourself. Um, I'm going to show you a tool in a little bit that you can use online to record yourself. But you can always just use the record function if you have a smartphone or something. And just record it, because you want to hear how you sound. Are you answering the questions? Do you get to the point? Do you have too many ums, too many ahs? Is there energy in your voice? There's a lot of nonverbal um, things that you want to be aware of when you're interviewing. So recording yourself is a great thing to do. This piece about pulling the job description apart, what that really means is when you're planning to interview for a job and you have that job description in front of you, look at it very, very carefully and get very clear about what is the employer looking for in somebody? What are the requirements? And you can be pretty sure they're going to ask you a question, or more than one question, of course, that starts to relate to some of those key, <clears throat> key requirements and skills that they're looking for. So pay close attention to the job description. It's really a good guide for you. This piece about researching the company, just do some basic research. Don't go crazy with it. But at least know a little bit about the company or the library or the organization that you're interviewing for and be able to kind of weave that into the interview conversation so that the employer knows that you have done your homework and you're really serious about the job and you've checked it out a little bit. I already talked about practicing out loud. And now I want to focus on a online tool called Big Interview. Oops, went too far. There we go, big interview. So give me a show of hands or smiley faces here. Has anybody seen this tool yet on the, on the career site or used this tool? Anybody? I didn't think so. You rarely do I come across people that have actually used it. And it's a fabulous tool that you have available to you. You can obviously use it from home. You've got you know, your headset, your microphone. And you can go, one, you can just watch a demo. You can see other people in an interview situation and how they're answering the questions. Um, where it's at, I don't even think I put the URL on this one here. Well, here's actually what you can go to. 
So to access Big Interview, and all this information, everybody, that I'm, that I'm going to be showing you tonight, it's all on the Career Development site on SLIS Web. So Amelia, if you want to put up the main URL for career development, that's great. But hope, do people, let me ask this, how many people know about the career resource, career development section on SLIS Web? Yes or no? We got a one, we got a two, three, two, <laughs> two, three. Okay, not as many people as I would like to see. So. That's number one, everybody. You've got to know that that resource is on there. It's on the home page. It's got its own tab, career development. And it's very, very detailed, very inclusive. Thank you. So there's the site, the URL for big interview. For first time users, here's the web address. And the SJS, SJSU Career Center has actually purchased this, which is why there's a special code for you as SJSU students so that you can go in. You don't have to pay anything. You'll set up your account. But then you can go in and practice. So you can watch demos of other people doing their interview. See, when you get there, it's going to be this big guy on there. You can identify um, what type of industry that you're interviewing in, and it will pop up some questions that you can practice with. Um, otherwise, you could just pick the questions that you want to practice with, and you can do it right there online, and you can save it, and then you can play it back, and you can hear yourself and see yourself. So it's a fabulous tool. I just want to make sure that you know that it's there and that you, it, you use that. Does anybody have any questions about using Big Interview before I move on? So I think it's a fabulous opportunity, but really few people do use it. Okay, if you guys think of something, let me know. Okay, so the other thing, oh, here, let me go back and check out some questions here, just a second. No, so that is a, thank you, that's a great question. Um, nobody else can see your, um, your mock interview or, or your post in there. So when you go up and set up your account, you're going in, you can access the account as many times as you want to and practice as many times as you want to, but nobody can go in and see it. So I don't have access to it. Other students don't have access to it. So it's a way for you just to go in and practice and feel confident that it's, it's just a tool that you can use. Now, you could do this. You could go in and practice, save your results, and then if you wanted to work with me on it, we could set up a, a time appointment on the phone. And then um, maybe we do it through Collaborate, through using Collaborate or something. You can pull up, or you can email the link to me. But either way, we could pull it up and we could watch it and talk about it. So there's many different things that we could do. Uh, let's see. The SJSU Career Center website is, was mentioned as a great resource. I went up and I attended it earlier. Oh my gosh, that's fabulous. Thanks for sharing that. Excellent. Let me go back to the URL and the code. So here's the main URL to access. And then the code, SJSU732. I think, there you go. Thank you guys for putting that back in there. OK. And again, all that information is on the career site. So you can always access it that way, too. OK. So moving on. These are some basic interview questions. So when you think about practicing, you want to pull out just basic interview questions and just practice whether you think you're actually going to get asked all those or not. It's a great way for you just to get your brain all ready to go. You start thinking about different examples that you can use. And the more you prepare, I don't think for an interview you can over prepare. So the more that you're prepared, when you walk in there, it's almost like no matter what they ask you, you can do it. You're ready to go. So these basic interview questions, again, are on SLIS website under career development under the interviewing section called basic interview questions. And all of these are there. But this is a great tool for you to use just to practice. Now, some people like to write these out and actually write your answers in. That Sometimes that works for people's brains. So identify if that's a good strategy for you. I like to write them out as well. There's something about, for me, connecting my hand to writing, it gets the the information into my brain better, and then I can start practicing my answers out loud. So find the strategy that works for you, but definitely don't wait until the night before you have an interview to all of a sudden start pulling all this stuff out and trying to prepare yourself. 
Thanks, Jamie. I think it is a really good strategy. Now, the three questions that I have in red bold, those are the three questions that I tell every person to have nailed, the answers to those questions nailed before you walk into any interview situation. So you want to definitely know what you're going to say to the tell me about yourself question. Because that's often the icebreaker question, right? It's often that first question when you first walk in, you shake hands, you make eye contact, you sit down, and they go, so tell me a little bit about yourself. So if you don't know what you're going to say right off the bat, and you kind of trip right there, that sort of sets the tone for the rest of the interview. So definitely practice that one ahead of time and know what you're going to say. It should come out, come out like a conversation. Um, you only talk about 30 seconds. You know, if you went 60 seconds, a whole minute, I think that's actually a long time to talk. So about 30 seconds is fine. Do keep your answer focused on, you know, on you professionally. They don't really want to know about you personally, meaning, you know, are you single, are you married, were you born in Nebraska and, you know, came to California or wherever you're at when you were 12 and, you know, they don't really need to know all of that, but keep it focused on you professionally. Maybe it's why you chose an MLIS or how many kind of years of experience you have in a particular field or what you have been doing job-wise or internship-wise that all relates to this particular position that you're interviewing with. So always bring it back to still why you're a good person for this particular job. You also want to know why do you want to work for this company or this organization or this particular department. So really put some thought into it. And oftentimes that can be a tricky question because sometimes the answer is, you know, you're, you're graduating perhaps in December. And the reason you want a job is because maybe you've got school loans you need to start paying back. But that can't be the answer that you give to an employer. So you've got to put some thought into it each time. Why do I want this particular position? And what am I going to say that sounds really compelling? The other thing that you want to absolutely know what you're going to say is why should they hire you? So what is it about you? What are your strengths? What are your skills? What are your qualifications? What's that thing about you that makes you unique or different compared to the other candidates that have applied for this position? So why should they hire you? So again, you've got to put some thought into it. But those are the three questions that I tell everybody to absolutely have those nailed. So it's OK if you have limited supervision or supervisory experience. Um, if that, so I'm going to guess, Marquita, that say you're applying for a particular position and they want somebody who has supervisory experience, but you're saying you have limited supervisory experience. I'm going to back that up a little bit and say there's still something about your resume that was interesting enough for them to bring you in for an interview, right? Because they don't bring everybody who applied for the position in for an interview or they don't call everybody who applied for a position on the phone for a phone interview. So there was something intriguing already about your resume that they wanted to talk to you. So anytime you're going in an interview, no matter what it is, whether it's supervisory skills or something else, you always focus on what you do have. You focus on the positive. You never bring attention to what you don't have or bring attention to how limited your supervisory experience is. You just focus on what it is that you do have or how much supervisory experience you have at this time. And hopefully that makes sense for you. Um, if your job skills are older or your employment's on hold while you're a full-time student. So um, what I'm gleaning from this question is that it doesn't matter unless they're technology skills, but if your job skills, if they're if separate from technical skills, if your skills are older, you still have them. They're still skills. So you still want to always focus on what you do have and what you can do for that organization. So being a full-time student, Nancy, you're developing a lot of skills as a full-time student that relate to the LIS field. So you're going to talk about the skills that you've learned in your coursework. And part of being, don't forget everybody, that this MLIS being a 100% online program, that's a skill in itself right there. Um, so you talk about what you've learned in your projects. You talk about skills that you've learned doing project work, particularly if it's virtual, right, but virtual projects and working with people, because that's a fabulous skill. Um, and any of the, the projects that you've done in, throughout your courses, internships, volunteer experiences, 
all of that. There are skills involved in all of those things that you want to talk about in the interview. Let's see, Deb, you may be going to discuss this, but you can please address the team versus independent question. Feels like a trick question. Tell me a little bit more what that, what do you mean by that question, Deb? I'm not sure. The team versus independent question. So write that out, one out a little bit more, and then I'll definitely address it. So the other question on this page here that's in the green, what do you, what do you consider to be your greatest strengths as they relate to this position, and even the weakness question. I wanted to bring some attention to that particular question. For me, when I'm in an interview and the employer asks me a question about my greatest strengths or what are the skills that I'll be bringing to this particular job, rather than stating one or even two strengths or skills, my thought is, they have now opened the door for you. They have said, what do you consider your greatest strengths, plural? So I say, walk through the door and lay them out there. So really be clear about what your strengths are and make sure you can name off, maybe five, maybe six, of what your skills and strengths are. Because you may never get that kind of open-ended question like that in the interview again. So you want to make sure that you let them know, here are all of the strengths that I have that I'm bringing to this job. So do be clear on that and make sure that you mention more than one or even two. Uh, let's see, here's a couple more questions. Third career, first microfilm tech, second program analyst, now library school. So for you, Nancy, you really, again, are going to focus on what are the skills that you have used or developed in the other positions that you've had that you want to bring with you into now your LIS field or when you move into an internship that relates to the LIS field. So it's all about the skills that we have and when we had have when we have had other jobs in the past that don't necessarily relate to the field that we're going into now, you always focus on the skills, which are called transferable skills, those skills that can transfer to any job that you go to. And that's what you're going to focus on. So I know in your microfilm tech and when you were a programmer analyst, there were a number of skills that you used in those particular jobs that you can still use now when you're moving on into an LIS position, and that's what you want to start to focus on. Ah, so here's Debs. Okay, do you prefer working in a team or independently? That, okay, I see what you're saying. What does an employer look for in this question? So, a little background into that question and a little background into what I'm hearing from uh, employers, particularly employers that are in libraries, whether it be public libraries or academic libraries. I've been hearing over and over from employers that they are really looking for people who are collaborative, who work well with other people, who can work in teams, who are willing to partner. Um, so if you're in an academic setting, they're looking for people who can partner between different departments on the campus because now people are having to collaborate more. That has to do a lot with budgets and resources. You find the same type of thing in a public library. Everybody is not in their own little position, their own little world or department. Everybody's working together. So what I think they're looking for in that question is, somebody who actually can do both, meaning, yes, you can work fine independently, but you also work really well as a team. So when you talk about what you prefer, you'd better pay close attention to what's on the job description, and if they talk in the job description about looking for someone who is collaborative, who can work in a team environment, then they're giving you a clue right there that you want to say, hopefully it's true, that you enjoy working in a team. So I hope that answered your question. That was an answer to my previous question. OK, so I knew that was coming, Amanda, how to approach the weakness. <laughs> it, it always comes up. And it's a I think it's kind of a ridiculous question that employers will ask. Um, and they won't always ask it, but Boy, they still do, because I'll hear it from people. So when you get the question about, you know, what is your weakness, um, you want to come up with something 
that really isn't a weakness. Um, it may not be necessarily your strength, but it's not this big blah thing that you're hanging out there that is a, really a weakness that relates to the job. And whatever it is you say, you want to make sure that you talk about how you have overcome it or how you have turned it in to a positive. So you actually want to stay away from using perfectionists as a weakness because now so many people use it that it's very cliche and most employers think, okay, they know that's not true necessarily. So stay away from using the, yeah, sorry, you got to think of another one. But I'll, and I'll let you guys know what mine is actually. But here's what I recommend. Put some thought into it. Come up with what works for you. What's a good solid answer to that? And write it down. And keep it in an interviewing file somewhere. So every time you're going to go to an interview and you pull out your interview file, which has your sample questions in it that you're going to use to practice with, you look at and remind yourself of what is the answer that you use for that weakness question. And you use the, that same one every single time. There's no reason to have to recreate that question every single time, right? So come up with something that works and use it. I'm going to go back and check out some of the answers here, some of the questions. It's a bit too deep. Yeah, actually, Nancy, that's, that's what I actually use. And I'll, sh and I'll give mine to you on how I use it. But, and, and because that actually is true for me, um, here's Laura's. Just too much of a team player. So how, then my weakness is I don't know everything. It makes me laugh. Is that a weakness? <laughs> Nutella. Hey, I've heard of people saying that. Like chocolate would be a weakness. And I think if you have the right sense of humor or you're working with the right interviewer, you might be able to use that and pull it off. Um, but things you don't want to say. I already mentioned that you don't want to talk about being a perfectionist. But you know, be aware what the job is you're applying for. So some people can actually say that a weakness is um, public speaking. But how they're working on overcoming that is they've joined Toastmasters and they're working on practicing it. But you wouldn't want to use that if public speaking or giving presentations was part of the job that you're applying for. That wouldn't work. Um, so here's how I use mine. And mine is the piece about being, um, <laughs> the part about being, I was reading the other comments there, being uh, too detail oriented. So mine is that uh, when I'm working on a project, I can tend to get too focused on the project because I get into too much of the detail and I lose sight of the big picture of what I'm working on. So I've learned for myself that when I'm in a project and I can feel myself getting too detailed, I kind of step back and I become refocused on what the big picture is of the project and what my focus is so that I can keep that, that bigger picture in mind. So what I've said being detailed and too focused is a negative for me or a weakness, I should say, for me. But it's not really a weakness. That's a positive in being detail-oriented. But how I work with it and how I overcome it is that I realize I'm doing that and then I step back. So that's what I've come up with for me. Um, you know, that's the thing I've written down and I use it every single time. So try to come up with something like that that's going to work that you can still turn it into a positive. So hopefully that kind of answers that question. Does anybody else want to put in what they say and we can see if it works? I do like the Nutella one. I really think that you could, someone, you could pull that off. If you're the right person with the right sense of humor, you could totally pull that off. OK. Um, I don't enjoy doing things I'm not good at. A weakness. I don't enjoy doing things that I'm not good at. So how do you overcome that then, Amanda? Do you have your way of saying how you overcome it? As long as you, I think whatever you say, as long as you can back it up with, here's how I've turned it into a positive. Here's what I've learned from it. Here's what I'm doing about it. That's because I know that challenge helps you grow as a person. Yeah. That works. That works. That feels authentic to you. Go for it. Looks like Ben's typing something. Okay, let's see. Oh, here's some other ones. Let me see. <laughs> so Scott's a funny person, I can tell. So I tend to be hard on myself. That could work. 
Jamie again, talking about though how you how you've overcome it. How do you work with that? The bottom line is you just don't want to leave some big thing out there that leaves a big red flag in the employer's mind. That's really the bottom line. I prefer to do things the way my employer has decided are best practices. <laughs> Let me see this one, this Susie. Can you say that lack of patience, oops, it went away, hold on. Lack of patience when you're working on a project that's about changing something. Well, part of that one, Susan's here is saying, can you say the lack of patience when you're working on a project that's about changing something? I'm not sure if I'm interpreting it correctly. How, the only thing I want to caution, if I am reading it correctly, is that, again, one of the key skills that employers are looking for in people today is being flexible, uh, adaptable, and being willing to change gears and directions quickly because the, um, the workplace is so dynamic today and it changes so often that you've got to be able to go with it and, and, and move with it and be patient with it. So I, I would just be a little cautious with that one if I'm interpreting what you wrote correctly. The politics. Uh, Laura, if that one is serious, again, I would be careful at that. Because um, office politics is something that no matter where you're at, right, it exists. It's there. And you definitely, I'm reading some of the other ones while I'm talking. Um, it's something, there's a piece about being astute to office politics. So I would be, I'd be a little cautious about that one. Really spotless. I'm still reading these. Yes, you could say that. Is that that's Jen. You could say that for sure. But I, I am again careful to pointing out what I don't have. So you could use it more generically. When I'm working in the situation that I don't have a lot of experience in, um, that makes me a little uncomfortable. But I've learned that I'm a quick learner and I catch on. I catch on to things very quickly. Maybe something like that. All right. <laughs> All right. If, you, if anybody wants to discuss the weakness question further with me, you can always email me. And we, can, we, can always go, uh, we can always go deeper into that. All right, I'm moving on. Here we go. Now, how many people have heard of behavioral or situational questions? Give me a, give me a hand up or a smiley face or something. I've got a one. I got a two, three, I got a four or five. All right, so really just not even half of you. OK, I have been haunted by them. So behavioral or situational questions, these you are definitely going to get in an interview, whether it's a phone interview but definitely in the in-person interview. Behavioral or situational questions are just that. They are trying to get at your behaviors, how you are as an employee, how you are as a worker, how you think, how you handle situations. So they are always going to start with, tell me about a time when. Give me an example of a time when. And then you know, ah, this is a behavioral or situational question. More and more interviews are framed this way, and the reason is employers really want to try to, it's kind of like get inside your head and see how you handle real life situations. So when they ask you these kinds of questions, they want you to give them a specific example versus generalizing. And generalizing means like, well, um, there's been times where that's happened and 
yeah, everything kind of worked out successfully. You know, kind of like you're not really giving a specific example. So when you get these, they want you to say, there was this time when I was working on this, this happened, and here's how I handled it. So, so that is a specific answer. I'm going to show you a formula you can use, but I'm going to check this question real quick right here. Yes, so these do make you nervous. However, if you start to practice, and you practice answering all kinds of questions, that's when you're going to be so prepared that I think you're going to be able to handle it. So here's a formula you can use. It's called STAR. And you might want to write this down if having formulas works for your brain. So in STAR, the S stands for the situation, T is for task, A is for action, and the R stands for result, or it could be the outcome or what you learned from the situation. You have once had a three-hour interview of it. Oh my, that is really brutal. Who was that? That is Jamie. That is really brutal. I'm very sorry for you. Did you get the job, though? That's what we really want to know. No, I'm, so, I'm sorry. <laughs> OK, so the situation, task, action, result. So when you get a star question, you know, tell me about a time when, uh, let, me find a, let me find a real life question here. Here we go. Um, give me an example of a time you set a goal and you were able to achieve it. So you set out kind of setting the stage. Basically, here was the situation or here was the task that I was working on. You might say something like, one of my professors announced a nationwide student contest sponsored by ALA. So SLIS was one of the many schools eligible to submit entries. So that's your situation, basically a situation or task. It's very short sets the stage, that's it. Where you want to spend the bulk of your time answering the question is in the action piece. So what you might want to say next is, I took the initiative to lead our six-person group and use my organizational skills to schedule a series of meetings via online conferencing. I facilitated our initial meeting to gather input from the team in order to determine and finalize our team's goal and strategy. I set due dates for work that needed to be done and delegated responsibilities to my team members. So all that action is focused on me. What did I do? You don't want to use, here's what we did, here's what the team did, because the interviewer isn't interviewing the we or the team. They're interviewing you. So you focus the action on what it is that you did. And then the last part, the result, that's really just kind of the conclusion. It just kind of wraps it up. So I could say our group's project was chosen from other campus entries to continue in the competition and won the regional competition. One of the judges said ours was the most organized team in the competition. Period. The end. That's all you say. So the benefit to using STAR is it keeps you on track. It keeps you focused. It makes sure you answer the question. And it keeps you from rambling all over the place. Because sometimes what people will do when they get situational questions is, they, and they don't know how to answer it, they just start rambling. And then now your part of your brain has realized, oh my gosh, I'm rambling. And then now you don't know how to stop it. And then you've gone too far. Or you see the interviewers writing your answer down, and there's this awkward silence, and then you just kind of keep talking. So if you focus on STAR, you just, here's the situation, here's what I did, Here's the result, and then you just stop. And that's it. So this is something I do want you to practice ahead of time, again, before your interview. And again, these sample behavioral questions are on SLIS web under interviewing, under the career resource section. And you, see, you can use these to practice. Even if you're going through and you think, I am never going to get asked that question, practice it anyway. It's not going to hurt, but it gets your brain thinking. So Deb, thank you for this, for your question. So Deb saying, what if you really don't have any true life examples for some of these questions? Now some of them you're going to have it because you just will. You're going to have to maybe dig deep, but you will. But here's a couple strategies that I think these are great strategies, so I hope you're all paying attention. Because if you get a question that you just don't know how to handle, there's a couple things I recommend. One is they ask you this question and you, and you think about it and you go, wow. That's really a good question. I'm going to have to think of it. Um, I'm going to need a little more time to think of an answer. Can we come back to that? 
And that's perfectly okay to do. And the employer will say, yeah, sure. And they will come back to it. Don't think they're going to forget it, because I've hoped that before in an interview, and it does not happen. They will come back to it. But it does buy you some extra time to start thinking, OK, did some, you know, what can I use? What's a good answer? So that's one strategy. <laughs> can I use the bathroom and call a friend? Can I call a friend? Um, the other strategy that I like to use is, again, if you get one of these questions and you really, like Deb's saying, you really can't think of a time in your life where this has ever happened to you, then what I'll say it really is that. I'll say, you know, that is a, that's a good question. And I can't think of a time in my life where that has ever happened to me. But if it did, here's how I would handle it. And then at that time, that's when you just go forth and you just kind of you know, pretend. If it did, here's what I would do. So at least you're giving them something. Because you never want to just not have an answer. Because you know in your interviews, right, they're writing your answers down. So you don't want to have a spot on your form where there's just a big zero through it. So those are the two strategies that I rely on if I just can't think of an answer. Yeah, so I, you're welcome, Deb. So that's a good idea, Amelia. Absolutely. I jot down a few answers. And when I mentioned earlier that I have an interviewing file, when I have all these practice questions that I have, particularly behavioral questions, uh, on my practice questions, I can just jot down a person's name, name of a project, um, just certain little key things that help me go, oh, yeah, I remember when I worked on that. And that way I have all that in my interviewing file. I pull this file out, I'm practicing my interviewing, and I know what I'm going to say. So for example, those questions about, you know, tell me about the most difficult person you ever worked with. Well, I can have a, just a person's name on my page, and I'll go, oh, I remember that person. And then I think about the answer that I'm going to say. So good strategies. OK, let's see. We talked about STAR. All right, so overall, in all of the questions that employers are asking you. They're really just looking for three things. So they want to know, one, can you do the job? And really what that means is, do you have the basic qualifications, the basic knowledge, the experience, the skill? So the, some of the questions they're going to ask you are just going to get at the basics. Do you have that foundational knowledge? Secondly, they're trying to find out, will you do the job? And what that all comes down to is your attitude. Are you showing that you are really interested in this job? Are you enthusiastic? Are you being positive? Do you show that you have a passion in this particular area? So they're really looking for that. And then thirdly, do you fit with the team or the organization? So they're checking out your personal style. They're looking at, are you a collaborative person? Do you have good communication skills? Maybe they're trying to see if you have a sense of humor. Are you funny? Because maybe our particular work group, we're a whole lot of fun. And if you aren't a person who's got a good sense of humor and can fit with us, that's not going to work. They might be trying to figure out if you're flexible, right? Can you go with the flow? A lot of times in our work organization, you know, things happen and we all have to just drop what we're doing and pull together. And they're trying to identify, are you that person? Are you willing to do what it takes to get the job done to make the whole team be successful? Or maybe, are you interested in learning? A lot of organizations, again, that's another key thing that they're looking for is people who demonstrate that they're lifelong learners because their organization is always maybe moving, being challenged, learning the new things, and they want to make sure you're going to fit. So overall, with all the questions that they're going to ask you, this is basically what they're trying to get at. Now, in addition, there are some other skills that employers are looking for. Oops, I went too far. There we go. So in addition to the skills that you see on a job description, they are really looking for that positive attitude. And I hear this from employers all the time. And it's kind of fascinating that this has come up as, as something that employers are mentioning, actually mentioning more and more. So positive attitude, that means smiling, right? And sometimes when we interview, we get so freaked out, we forget to smile. So be human, smile. Um, demonstrate that you are a collaborator and that you are a team player. So that can come up when you talk about projects, talk about how you've worked at work or how you model that to other people. Demonstrate that you are flexible. Demonstrate that you're open-minded and you're a lifelong learner. And definitely be able to relate your past experience to this job. This is another thing that I've specifically heard from employers is that 
and this is this is more typical with new grads that they haven't connected the dots in their own brain to be able to communicate that out to the interviewer about what they've how they've used their past experience and how it can move over into this new job. So that's something you need to sit with for a while and get clear for yourself, and then you can communicate it to other people. And definitely, definitely demonstrate that you're technologically savvy, no matter what field of LIS that you're interviewing for or going into. Technology is key. So definitely be able to talk about that you're comfortable, you're willing to learn new things, you're aware of um, emerging technology. Social media, that's, that comes up a lot as well. OK, moving on. So in the interview, yes, do ask questions at the end of the interview. It is super, super important. Let me see if I have any questions. Let me take a couple questions here. Ah, so there's a question here from Pam. Can I cover what recruiters may ask in a screening interview? So in screening interviews, which are typically the phone interview, one of the main, well, a couple of the main things that they want to know is, one, they want to understand, they want to see what your understanding of the job is. So do you understand the position that you've applied for? And perhaps it might be what questions you have for them about the particular job. Um, the other thing that they really want to find out from the phone screen is they want to hear you talk. They want to get a sense of your communication style because, right, they don't know you, they haven't met you, they can't see you. So this is their first impression of you, is just how you sound on the phone. So really important to practice ahead of time and record yourself, right, and hear how you sound. Because sometimes it's even kind of shocking when you hear yourself. Um, some people may not realize when they're on the phone how, and I hope this is none of you, but how dull you might sound. Like there's no energy in your voice. And if somebody doesn't know you and that's their first impression, that's what's coming across. So it's important to know that. So they want to see what your understanding is. They want to hear you talk. And they really are just trying to find out if you have the basic qualifications that so that they can move you on to another interview. So really quick so we don't get off track, but strategies here would be if you're applying for jobs and you might have some phone screen uh, interviews, keep a copy of your resume right by the phone. Keep copies of job descriptions of positions you've applied to right by the phone. So if somebody calls, they're going to tell you what company they're from. You can look through. You can find that job description. You can kind of brief yourself. Oh, yeah, this is that job. Here's some of the key things that this job is about. And you're more prepared that way to actually talk about it. There is a whole section, again, on Swiss Web under the Career Development Resources on the phone interview. And there's actually, let me go to the end here to show you something, right here. Uh, under career development, under our career webcasts and workshops right in here, there's actually a workshop that I did about acing the phone interview. So you could go back and listen to that because that talks all about how to prepare for it and how to get through that phone interview. Oh, so this is, okay, I'm going to come back to yours in just a second, Jen. That sounds good. Thanks, Jerry, for that tip. I'll have to check that one out. OK, so let me go back to where I was. And Jen brings up a fabulous point. So you're feel, you feel weird asking about their job when you're the one being interviewed. So here's what I would challenge you to do, Jen, is to think about the interview as a conversation between two people. So yes, you're definitely being interviewed. But you're also interviewing them. Because you're trying to identify, is this a place that where I actually want to work? Are you a, a manager that I actually want to work with? Is this a place that's going to work for you? So you need to ask them questions. You want to ask them questions so that you can identify for yourself if this is going to be a good fit for you. So by twisting that around in your head, that actually gives you a little bit of the control and the power back in the interview situation 
sometimes can make you a little less nervous as well, because it's not just all about them interviewing you, but you're definitely interviewing them. So when I say yes, do ask questions. When you get typically about to the end of your welcome, when you get to the end of the interview, usually the employer at that point, they've got maybe five or so minutes left, and they've built this time into the interview. And they'll say, so what questions do you have for us? And this is where I'm saying, yes, you absolutely want to have questions. You want to write them out ahead of time, write them on paper, have them in your professional portfolio folder when you walk into the interview. When they get to this point at the end and they say, what questions do you have for us? You open that portfolio, that folder up, and there's your questions. So it shows to the employer right there, you are prepared. You put some thought into the questions that you want to ask. You're enthusiastic about this job, and you're interested in this job. The thing that drives me and other interviewers insane is when the interviewee doesn't have any questions to ask. That makes me crazy. I want to hear what you're asking me. I'm, I wait to get to the end of the interview so I can be like, what is this person going to ask me? Because that tells me so much about you. So here are just some sample questions. And again, these are on the SLIS website under career development. But this just gives you some idea of some of the questions that you could ask. So you don't have to worry about writing all these down because it's on there. It's on the website. I have some additional ones that you could add. You could ask somebody, you could ask the employer, what are the top three things you like about this company or working here? That tells you a lot about that work environment, a lot about that culture. So for me, a lot of these questions are important because I like to see what the person's reaction is. And I definitely want to hear what they're going to say about working there and working in the culture. You could ask them how they got started in the field, because you might be really interested to know, how did this person actually get here? And again, that just shows that you're interested. You could ask, how long does the average person stay in this position? So what that tells you right there is, uh, you know, are people just getting in and then out because maybe this is not a good position? Or if people are sticking around a long time, I go, hmm, this must be a pretty good place to work. You could also ask, where did the person who had this position before go? The reason for asking that is, one, you can find out, was the person promoted and moved up into another department? So now you're realizing, ah, so they do promote from within. Or you find out this is a brand new position. Or you find out the person left. And that kind of makes you go, hmm, I wonder what's up there. Another question you could ask is, what are your expectations of the person coming into this particular position? So that, again, gives you a sense of, you know, what's this manager like? Do they have realistic expectations for the person that they're going to be hiring? So it helps you kind of walk away with a pretty good sense of, you know, what's kind of going on here? And is this a place that I'm really interested in? Yes, Tam, thank you. That is one of the best suggestions. Doing your informational interviews is one of the best ways for you to start practicing your communication skills and your interviewing skills and getting more comfortable kind of talking about yourself and asking questions. So I definitely recommend that. So Amanda's question is, how do you address these questions to a panel? That's a great question. So I will still have all of my questions here. And I sometimes I address a question to the entire panel. So the ones that I like, the ones I'll say to the whole panel, it would be like, what do you like best about working here? And I love to hear what each person might say. Or one time when I was in a panel interview and I asked that question, everybody stopped, who was on the panel, they all kind of stopped and they looked at each other with this kind of funny look in their eyes. And I thought, huh, that seems odd. And that made me think like, Maybe there isn't too many good things about working here. So it's a, so it's, you can just kind of play it that way and watch what people do. But um, so panel, you can ask your question to the whole panel. Or you might direct one question to one person, one of your questions to another person. Kind of play it by ear. So the question down here at the bottom in red, what is the next step in the interviewing process? you absolutely want to ask that question because you want to make sure when you walk out the door, you know what the next step is. Are they going to be calling me 
or the you know people in, in the next two weeks? Are they calling people by next Friday? Are they still interviewing and they won't be getting back to people for a month? I mean, you want to know what's up. So definitely ask that question. And again, it shows you're on top of things. You're prepared. You're interested. You're you know getting the information that you need. So don't be afraid to ask your questions. Employers expect it. And yes, do send a thank you note. I ask employers this question on a regular basis to see if it's something that's still a big deal. And yes, it is a big deal. You can handwrite it or you can send them an email. Either way seems to be fine. Um, there are some employers who, when you take the time to actually handwrite a thank you note, that means a lot to them. And there's other employers who, you know, getting the email is fine. So it, I haven't found a um, um, I lost the word I was going to use, but um, you know, I haven't found the way that everybody agrees upon, except that they agree that yes, the thank you note is the way to go. You don't have to put a whole lot in there, but go through the effort. And still, not everybody does it. Not every interviewee does it. So when you do, it's a great way to make yourself stand out. You want to make sure you send it uh, 24 to 48 hours after your interview. So make sure that you get a business card, or at least you have the correct spelling of the person's name. You have the address or an email address so you know where to send it. If it's a panel interview, you really should send one to each person on the panel. If you left the interview and you, you know, didn't have everybody who was on the panel, at least send it to the main person. And then you could ask, you could, or you could write one to each person and send it to that one person and ask them to give it out. So there's, there's different strategies that you could use that way with the thank you letter. Do you guys have questions about the thank you letter? If you do, let me, let me see if anybody's writing. And, okay. Well, thanks, Jerry. All right, a note about references. So your references, they should not be part of your resume, which means they are not on the resume document. Your references are, are a completely separate piece of paper. Whoever you put as your reference, you absolutely get permission from them first. So you check with people. Hey, would you be willing to be a reference for me? Or I'm going to be graduating soon. Would you be willing to be one of my references? And then yes, ask if they can give you a good reference, because usually if they're if you ask for permission and they don't feel confident giving you a good reference, that's when they should let you know at that point. So I had somebody, one of our student assistants in the Career Center asked me once to be a reference. And I just didn't know, I felt, I didn't know her work style, I felt well enough to, to do a good job of being a reference, so I had to let her know that. You know, I, I'd be happy to, but I don't feel like I could do the best job because I don't feel like I really work with you enough. To, um, be, to be able to really talk well enough about what you could do. And so that's OK. Well, your question is a good question, Nancy. The, you know, um, I'm, I'm thinking if you only have them in one class, do you feel like they could be a good reference for you? So if you feel like they could be a good reference for you, then certainly ask them, right? So thank you, Jen. Um, that's not kosher. <laughs> so putting references available upon request on your resume is an old school resume um, technique. And so when I see that or other people see that on resumes today, it automatically kind of points out like this is a dated, um, either the person is somewhat dated or definitely the resume is dated. So I leave that off. It's not necessary. If they want your references, they're going to ask you for it. Yeah, so you're going to have to determine when you use faculty members um, or professors if you feel like they could do a good job. So definitely ask for permission. Your resumes do not need to be past supervisors. Some people think that it always has to be the past supervisor, and not necessarily. You know, maybe you didn't have the best relationship with a past supervisor. Maybe the person's moved on and you have no idea where they're at. Um, you know, whatever reason, you have the you have the, the choice to choose who you want to be your references. 
So don't feel like it could only has to be supervisors. I like to use a variety of people. So I may have a supervisor. I may have a, a coworker who I worked with who knows me well. I might have somebody who um, was my assistant, who I was their boss, and now they're giving a reference based on a, in, you know, a different perspective. So I like to use a variety of people. And my last point about coaching your references. So that's when you let them know. people. So you've already asked for, for permission. Yes, people will be your reference. Now you're getting to the point where you're going to do a job search. And so you let somebody know, hey, I applied for a job, and they've asked for references. So I have um, you know, supplied them your name and contact information. So you might be getting a call. Here's what I'd like you to say. Or here's the position I'm applying for. You can even send them a job description. You could send them a copy of your resume. Um, you know, make sure you point out you know, this time when you and I worked on this one project and um, demonstrate my team, my teaming skills or whatever it is. But you can coach them. So don't feel odd about that. You know, they're, they're doing you a favor. They're there to help you out to get a job. So feel free to kind of let them know. Give them some pointers on what you'd like to say. Okay, here's some little odds and ends. Um, I think this is kind of funny. Someone just sent me this funny little thing at the bottom here. And I'm going to take this question real fast. Thanks, Carmen. That was a good suggestion there, too. <laughs> All right, so my odds and ends. Um, real quick about professional attire. You know, I always make the assumption that I don't need to bring that up, and then I'll find out later that it's something that I should bring up. Because sometimes I'll get feedback that people didn't necessarily put the thought into it. So no matter what type of LIS position you are interviewing for, you know, do make sure you're, you're professionally dressed. You're going there to make a first impression. You know, dress up more than you normally would. If you're not sure what the culture is at a particular library or a particular environment, you can always ask an HR person. You, if you can physically go to the place and check it out, do it. But, but make sure that you put the effort into it. Don't let something as silly as not dressing appropriately hold you back from getting a job. Um, the point about your keys. I actually take, the only key I'll bring in is the key, actual key to the car. And I leave the big, you know, wad of keys in, in the car so that I'm not bringing in anything that's big, it's clunky, it's jingling, it's jangling. Um, don't bring your phone in, even if you have it muted. Just don't even bring it in. We have a tendency to look at it. Um, if we get nervous, we get bored. Now we're checking, you know, Facebook or something. Um, it might still go off and rattle. Just just leave that in the car. Don't bring any big bulky bags. Don't bring backpacks. Usually what I'll bring in, right, I'll grab the key, just put it in a pocket just for that, just for the interview so I don't have the bulky keys. I have my professional um, portfolio folder. Bring copies of your resume, extra copies, even if you know, oh, they already have it. I've heard of some employers using that as a trick to see how prepared you are. We've got two minutes, so I'm talking really fast now. But they've actually gotten to the interview and said, um, do you have a copy of your resume? And they want to see if you're prepared. So that's in my folder. I have written down my questions to ask. I might have a copy of my references. There's a pen in there. I'll probably bring a bottle of water in with me. And that's it. Nothing else. Make sure you do not discuss the salary, benefits, vacation, anything like that in the interview. That's something later on once they have gotten to um, offering you a job. You could certainly bring in your business cards if you have some. That would definitely work. And real quick, because I want to keep us on time. Under career development, here's the interviewing section, which I've talked a lot about. So those of you who have not been here, please go check it out, just so you're familiar with what's here. And when you need the resources, you know where to get them. Also, as I mentioned earlier, under here, the Collaborate Workshops. There is a whole workshop on interviewing etiquette, do's and don'ts. There's a workshop on answering tough interview questions. There's a workshop on acing the phone interview. And coming up in May, I will be doing a workshop on uh, interviewing an open forum questions and answers. So again, really informal, um, less 
you know, less prepared than this one, meaning just really open-ended so that you can ask me the questions that you have. You can always follow up with me and we can do a mock interview over the phone. You can ask me interview questions, um, you know, so we can always prepare so that know that you have a resource here. So it is 6.30 on the nose and I know it's 8.30 or 9.30 where some other people are, so we're definitely going to wrap this up. But again, if you have questions, um, I'll go back to the beginning one. So you have my email address. Boom, there it is. Send me your questions. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Amelia, for organizing it. It's always a pleasure to, to talk with all of you and answer your questions. And have a great night. Thank you, everybody, for coming. The